so this year for Kaleidoscope, uh, the ICA State Chairs had the idea to facilitate uh, a competitive application for students to participate in the virtual conference. So uh, we put out a call for proposals for presentations and a call for performers to submit pre-recorded performances. And we're pretty overwhelmed by the quality and scope of the response. We had way, way more qualified um, candidates than we could honor for performance and for presentation. But we're really honored we get to feature some of our incredible future leaders of the field during this conference. So um, at two o'clock, we had an amazing showcase of performance from um, from some of the winners of the performance side of things. And that video is on YouTube, so I encourage everybody to go watch it if you didn't get a chance to watch it already. We had a really variety filled and exciting performance. And now we're going to have three presentations from the three selected winners of this competition. Um, so we're going to kick it off right away with Megan Taylor, who is a doctoral student at the University of North Texas. Um, the pre presentation goes 15 minutes, and then there will be time for questions at the end. So please do feel free to write in the chat or at the end to raise your hand, and we will get to those questions. If you would turn off your video camera while Megan is presenting, we'll uh, give her a little bit of free space, and then we'll have a chance to come back and congratulate her and ask questions at the end. So I will turn it over now to future Dr. Megan Taylor. Thank you so much, Dr. Hudson. Um, my name is Megan, like he said. Um, I am also a, a yoga, certified yoga instructor. Um, so today we're gonna be going through a little bit about um, some breath work and some movement exercises you can do in the classroom. I'll give a brief introduction on to why those are important at the beginning. If you have questions as we go, feel free to just drop them in the chat and we can get to them towards the end here. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Um, while I'm getting this set up, feel free to participate in as much or as little as you want to today. I will be demoing some things, um, so feel free to join if you feel so inclined. But again, everything is totally optional. Um, so like I said, we'll be talking about movement and breathwork in the practice room today. And we'll start by um, going through just an overview of injuries, um, structuring your practice to incorporate these types of movement and breathwork into your practice sessions, and then going through the actual movement and breathwork toward the end. So starting off by going through overview of injuries. Um, so the famous uh, Martin Fishbein study from uh, the 1980s revealed that about 82% of musicians uh, re report experiencing some kind of medical problem that um, can impact their playing throughout their performance career. Um, at least one of the problems that were reported in this study made it was severe enough that it affected their ability to perform. So we wanna encourage taking breaks during practice just to try to mitigate some of these issues. And I'll go through in the next couple of slides kind of why that is important here. Um, I don't know if you have thought about it, but do you, does anyone have any guesses on how many uh, problems musicians or clarinetists specifically report experiencing? What percentage of clarinetists ex report experiencing some kind of medical problem? And I'll check the chat here just to see if there's any guesses. 65, 75. A study that my colleagues and I did and we presented at Clarinet Fest in 2019 actually revealed that about 90% of clarinetists experience some kind of problem which is quite a lot. So we want to try to make that um, a decreased number if we can. Um, the most prevalent pain sites that were reported were the right thumb and the bottom lip, which are pretty obvious just because that's where the clarinet comes in contact with the body the most. And a lot of forces are placed there. So coming to how do injuries happen? So we have three factors, force plus posture plus repetition leads to possible injury. So the force, if you're thinking about it, is just the way that the instrument is pressing down on the body, um, the force of gravity. Posture is not only how you're sitting, but also how you're holding the instrument, kind of the angle of the wrist, those sorts of issues. Repetition is just how much you're playing and then also how much you're doing other things in your life that could uh, trigger the same kind of uh, muscle activation. So typing on your phone to text or on the computer, even cooking can lead to some injuries for some people. And this, any time that one of these is severely out of, out of whack is when we can lead to a possible injury. So structuring your practice to avoid some of these. Um, current research kind of says to take about 25, 20 to 25 minutes of playtime and then have a five minute break. This is because as you're going through on this time to fatigue skill here, you start over on the left side when you're playing and it's nice and easy. And then eventually as you keep practicing, you'll get to a point where you're starting to fatigue a little bit, getting a little tired. Then you might go into introducing some more tension into the body. And eventually over a long period of time, you might come to pain or ultimately failure where you're not able to actually play. By taking rest, you kind of give yourself a little credit going backwards on the scale. So I like to think about it. Um, if you've ever played a video game that has a, when you go underwater, there's like a health bar. And then 
your breath fills all the way up when you're at the surface, but as you go under, it kind of decreases for a specific amount of time until you go back to the surface and resurface. So that's kind of re um, capture some more breath. That's kind of the analogy we're going for here. So taking a little bit of time just allows you to hopefully extend your time to play in ease and also eventually develop more endurance. So we know that from the research, consistent practice with adequate rest is how we build endurance as a musician, which is something we want, right? We wanna be able to play clarinet for a long period of time, um, healthily and with ease without having to feel those sensations of tension or pain or ultimately leading to failure with the instrument. Which brings us to movement and breath work. So what can you do in your practice session when you are taking that five minute break? There's lots of options here. I'm sure you're thinking of some already, like maybe going for a walk, getting a snack, taking a drink of water. Those are all amazing things, but sometimes you just need to do something different and resist the urge to pick up your phone and just start texting, right? Or getting on Instagram. So I'll be going through just some uh, options for you today of things that I like to do during my practice that will give just some general relief to the body. So I'm actually gonna scoot this just a little bit further back here so you can hopefully see me a little better. And I'm in my, my practice chair here. So this is very realistic for us. So we're gonna do the breath work side of things first. And I will stop sharing my screen momentarily here. Okay. So when you are ready, we'll just take a moment to kind of settle into your seat. Obviously, taking your instrument and setting it off to the side would be a good idea here, placing it on the stand. I would hate for it to fall or something. Um, but right now, we'll just take a moment to settle in. It might feel nice to kind of close down your eyes or just gently kind of rock side to side, just noticing how your body's feeling in this moment. Might take a deep breath or two. let your body come to as still as it feels good to you today. It doesn't have to be rock solid. If you have an itch you want to scratch, feel free to scratch it or if you want to keep wiggling around, that's okay too. So we'll go through breath work first here because this activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which will reduce some of those flight or flight um, responses that maybe you get when you're practicing, but maybe you don't. This is also just a good thing to start introducing into your practice so that if you have fight or flight come up when you are in a performance situation, a little bit of performance anxiety or something like that, you've already kind of incorporated it into your routine so you can get used to it before you need to use it. If at any time during this practice you have um, lightheadedness, feel free to just stop whatever you're doing and let your breath return in natural, remain seated here. I would definitely recommend that, especially if it's your first time trying any sort of breath work. So we'll go through two breaths today. The first one being a Dirga Pranayama, which is a three-part breath. This is a nice calming breath to sort of soothe the parasympathetic nervous system. And then we'll go to more of a balancing breath. Nadi Shodana is what it's called in yoga, but it's just alternate nostril breathing. So when you're ready, you can invite one of your palms to rest on your belly, the other one to rest on your chest. And as you inhale, I'll let your belly fill first, then let your chest rise. And then finally, your collarbone. So we're taking this breath in three parts. As you exhale, we'll soften the belly, soften the chest, and then soften your collarbones. Inhale, fill belly, chest, collarbones. Exhale, belly, chest, collarbones. Inhale, belly, chest collarbones, and exhale, belly, chest, collarbones. If this breath is feeling good to you, you can continue taking those three parts for a couple of more just to feel what it does to your body. You might notice your heart rate slowing down a little bit here, feeling more softness in your shoulders, your chest. You also have the option to layer in a little bit of heat here if you're feeling sort of tired today or when you're practicing by incorporating ujjayi pranayama, which means victorious breath. And it kind of sounds like an ocean wave or Darth Vader breath by just constricting the back of your throat as you breathe. So I'll demonstrate that here.
you feeling that constriction really a lot on the exhales in my body. Take about one more here. And then gently release your palms, just let your breath return to natural. We'll go from here into our Nadi Shodhana, our alternate nostril breathing. So for this one, you can bring the pointer and middle finger into your palm here, or just rest them on your temple. And you're gonna be using your ring finger here and your thumb to close your nostrils. So we'll start by inhaling through the nose. Then close your left nostril, exhale out your right. Inhale right. Use your ring finger to close your nostrils and then open your left nostril. Exhale left. Inhale left. Close. Open right. Exhale. Inhale right. Close. Open left. Exhale. Inhale left, close, open right. If this feels good, you can continue at your own pace here or release your palm at any time. We'll take about one or two more cycles here, just an introduction to this breath. After your next inhale, allow your palm to release. Let your breath return to its natural state. So that is um, a couple of options for breath work that you can do in, in a practice break. We'll go into some movement now that might be nice to introduce into your practice. We'll start with some wrist stretches. We do a lot of activity with our hands during our playing. So it's nice to get uh, those to move out. So we'll just start by taking some soft wrist circles going in whichever direction feels natural to you to start. And then maybe switching the other way. You can take fists here if that feels better to some of you. Flat hands or open hands would feel, could also feel nice. And then from wrist circles, press your palms to heart center. Let your wrist drive down to really open through the bottoms of your forearms here. For some of you, this might not feel like a lot of sensation, so you might tip your fingertips away from you. That can get a little deeper maybe tip them toward you. Just experiment with what feels good. Draw your fingertips back to center if they're not there. And place the backs of your palms together. We'll do these reverse prayer hands as you let your elbows come down. This side can feel a little bit more intense for some people. So again, just be really gentle here. And then gently release your fingertips. Allow your fingers just to shake out for a second. We'll go into a twist here. As you inhale, reach your arms up high. And exhale, take your left hand to your uh, back of your chair, your right hand to your knee as you open your chest to the left side of your space. So nice long spine here. We do a lot of sitting hunched over when we play clarinet. So we're just trying to open the chest a little bit here. Good, gently release. Inhale, both arms high. Exhale to the opposite side, left hand down, right arm back. Take one more breath here. Inhale, both arms up. Then exhale, take your elbows wide, almost like a cactus shape or goal pose. Arms reach your chest to the ceiling. This is a great little heart opening here to reverse that hunched overness that we have sometimes when we're playing clarinet. Two minutes, Megan. Awesome, thank you. Inhale, reach your arms back up. And then exhale, take your left hand to the outside of your right thigh, reach your right arm up overhead. So the whole purpose of these kinds of movements is to really get into an opposite shape from what we're doing when we're playing clarinet. Inhale, reach your arms up. And then we'll exhale, right hand to the outside of your left hip, reach the left arm up overhead. You're always an option here to connect this with your movement, to connect the breath with your movement. We'll take one more cat uh, shape with the back. Exhale to open your chest, reach your cactus arms wide. 
Inhale, both arms up. Exhale to float down. The last thing we'll do here is a half sun salutation, which we'll actually do seated here, but you can have the option to do it standing. So you'll start by just inhaling to reach your arms up. Then exhale, you'll fold over your legs, taking your chest to your thighs, letting your head be heavy here. For some of you, it might feel good to just nod your head yes or shake your head no as you fold over. And then with an inhale, press your way back up to seated, reach your arms high. Exhale, release your palms back down to your lap. So those are some options that I love for practice. I'll go ahead and drop this little uh, handout that I have. I just went over some of the names of things that we did during class today. And then I will hand it back over to the team here. Thank you so much, everyone. I feel very relaxed. Um, could we get some questions for our clinician? Feel free to type in the chat or to uh, just raise your hand and Jessica will, un will invite you to speak or unmute you. Question. Okay, here, what are the most common injuries clarinetists have reported? Yeah, some of the things we found were um, like carpal tunnel, tendonitis, those sorts of things, which are pretty common, I'm sure. Also a little bit of performance anxiety was something that came up a lot in our survey. Um, those are the main things. Um, I would say that the, the things to keep in mind are just like where those areas of pain were. So the right thumb was a big area and then also the lower lip. So just being really um, mindful. Gail, yeah, TMJ was something that was reported not by as many people, but definitely by some people as um, they took the survey. A lot of people said that I have a little bit of TMJ symptoms just from clarinet playing and I'm sure just general stress and that kind of thing too. But yeah, just being mindful of where those pain sites are and just being able to take care of those essentially, like giving yourself forearm massages here to kind of eliminate some of that uh, thumb pain, but then also um, taking breaks with your embouchure, doing some um, mental practice, those sorts of things to give yourself a little bit of a break to decrease the lower lip pain there. Excellent. Yes. Andy, I do we... have a handout and I will send it to Jessica, who I think is going to put it on the website. Andy, this is Bob. Can we just ask her something or do we have to type it? Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Um, I actually uh, did some pretty major damage myself about 15 years ago, but it was, it was Amisher damage. And one of the things that the doctor at the Cleveland clinic told me was that, um, that pain is our friend when it comes to clarinet playing, that once we feel that, and I really appreciated your document at the beginning, once we feel that, um, we should stop. <laughs> and, and he also introduced, um, some of the things that you were showing today to me to relax the, the neck and the throat. Mine was in my neck where I, where I pulled some muscles. So thank you so very much. It was really yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I yeah. love that. That pain can sometimes be a, just an indicator of something being, uh, something needing to change. And so if you're needing that, that little break here, it can be a good indicator for that sort of thing too. That's a great point. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for that comment. And there's a question in the chat about the handout, which yes, uh, Megan has a handout, which will, you want to drop that in the chat now? Megan, or? Yeah, I was trying to hear. I just wasn't quick me, enough. I'll Sorry. Put it on the website. <laughs> okay, Jessica, okay. Jessica, put it on the website for us. It, that sounds I'll share the link in the chat for the last presentation, you know, during the next presentation. Um, Excellent. We need to move on. Um, I thank you so much, Megan. Um, if you guys thank have you, any Megan. interest in what um, Megan is doing, please reach out to her. Um, and also, um, we have a lot of content um, in store for coming months with our health and wellness committee, which Megan is the chair of. So definitely um, check that out. And we have some other previous recorded sessions on our YouTube channel that you can check out. So we're going to move on to our next presentation. So I'm going to get out of the way. Thank you, Jesse. So that'll be available to everybody. Thank you, Megan. It was wonderful to hear from you. Next, we'll move to Marco Tomasi. Marco is an undergraduate student at Crane School, SUNY Potsdam. And Marco will be talking about compositional technique and listener expectation in Mark Eschen's Sonata for Clarinet, Basse, Bass Clarinet, Sonata, and Piano. This is a great piece if you don't know this piece. I was really excited that somebody else in the world is as geeky about this piece as I am. So I'll turn it over to Marco. Welcome, please, Marco Tomasi. Thank you. Uh, share screen. Share sound. Okay. 
Here we go. Can you guys see my PowerPoint slides all right? I see a thumbs up. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Marco Tomasi. I'm a, a junior music history and music performance voice clarinet student at uh, SUNY Potsdam Crane School of Music. First, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to hear these papers presented by both myself and my colleagues. Um, and I'd like to extend special thanks to the ICA state chairs, um, my clarinet professor and New York state chair, Dr. Julian Doyle and Dr. Tim Sullivan for advisement on this project. So I came across this piece, uh, I would say about a year ago, I was um, just looking on YouTube for things to play. And I, I came across this on Van Doren TV and I was, I was captivated by it. Um, there is a certain kind of uh, self kind of fulfillment when you realize after a few listens to the piece that a lot of the, the material is used um, in later sections of the piece. Um, and it was just really rewarding to discover that. So let me, uh -oh, there we go. Um, so uh, generally this was, complete, this was completed in September, 2015 in France by Marc Aichen. Um, Marc Aichen was born in Algeria and traveled to and from France rather frequently. Um, and it's said that the piece pays homage to the French clarinet compositions of the 20th century, like Blanc, Francois, Chasson, and Tomasi, which I must qualify, I am not related to, um, excluding the last name. So the piece is written in four movements, in the forest, the squirrel, at the foot of an oak, and Jux, um, a game match. Um, I'm going to be looking at the squirrel in some detail. Generally speaking, this piece um, there's an affinity for the extremes of both the bass clarinets, uh, higher and lower registers. Um, the highest note is an A above, an octave above the A above the staff, and the lowest note is a low C, a thumb C. Um, and there's a lot of imitation between both inside the clarinet part, in the piano part, and between both. Um, so this really provided me with enough material to study in terms of compositional choices and how they can really impact how you, how you listen to music. So the squirrel, um, generally speaking, the form is ABA with an additional coda. Um, and it's, it's roughly an E-flat major. I'm a little hesitant to, to label it an E-flat major because a lot of the harmony in this movement is non-functional. Um, but the tonal center is uh, E flat major. Um, and some more specialized characteristics on this movement, there are a lot of rapid meter changes um, and some do create a hemiola effect. There is very frequent modulation of the main theme and there are some chromatic passing sections and passing tones um, that serve uh, more so in ornamental uh, purpose. So we'll listen to the first 30 or so seconds here and then we'll move to some figures. Uh, somebody please, if you can't hear this, let me know. <laughs> stop it there. Um, so continuing, uh, we see here we have the main theme in the bass clarinet part with the piano accompaniment in E flat um, with a, a, a rather boom chucky pattern um, for a lack of better words. Um, we have the B section which is marked by a slightly slower tempo, tempo which recalls the, um, the first movement which we'll get to in just a few moments um, in some longer notes and then more uh, homogeneous texture. And we have in the A prime section, a return to the original, uh, both melodies and incumbent pattern. Um, and the coda is rather interesting. We're gonna look at this in a little bit more detail further on, but the coda recalls the uh, melodic and harmonic structure of the first movement, while also um, blending some elements of the second movement, the staccato notes, which I think is just, it's very interesting. So here we have um, just a, uh, a, um, 
a harmonic analysis of the first few measures of this movement. Um, pay closer attention to measures four, five, six, and seven. Um, we have some rather unusual chords, to say the least. We have an A flat to a D flat augmented major seven to an A sharp diminished over C sharp. And then we get to some more uh, standard chords, although they're still not functional. There's a lot of movement by second and third. And to demonstrate this, I made a little voice leading reduction here. Um, so we can see the only movement by uh, an interval greater than a, uh, a major second, a whole step, is this octave jump, which can be debated, it isn't really a movement anyways. Um, so we see this really um, well-written parsimonious voice leading, um, which on first listen, you don't really expect to see, um, especially with the uh, octave jumps and the capriciousness of the part. So here we can see all the modulations of this main theme throughout just the second movement. Um, we begin in E flat, there's a passage in F. Um, and something interesting here at marked one, the grand staff uh, figure I've included, is there's a reversal between the left hand of the piano and the bass clarinet. So in this case, the bass clarinet is playing the accompaniment and the piano, the left hand of the piano rather, is um, kind of took the role of the bass clarinet. And we see up back at the top again, we're in F sharp major, E flat, and then F sharp in here at this other figure of the grand staff, we see another flip where now the bass clarinet is playing the left hand of the piano and the piano is playing something which resembles the, the boom chuck of the bass clarinet. And now finally, we have some uh, excerpts on the uh, aspect of repetition and imitation between um, the bass clarinet and piano. So the imitation occurs both within the individual part of the bass clarinet and the piano. Um, but in this case, I'm labeling this as the lurching repetition or the lurching effect. This occurs at the end of a phrase at a, um, sometimes at a cadence point, uh, sometimes not, but usually at the end of a, a passage. Um, and this effect is rather interesting because it goes against what we think of Western art music and a reinforced cadence in say Beethoven where the cadence is repeated and repeated it over and over again to really emphasize that this is the ending. But in this sonata, that's kind of the opposite. The cadence, the repetition only creates more question in the listener's mind of where the music is going to head next, which I felt is particularly striking. Um, and now more on a, a fun note, the title of the movement, The Squirrel, we see this really clearly in really how light the texture is. Um, the piano part is not very low. The bass clarinet part is really centered in the uh, throat tones of the clarion register, producing a, a pretty pure centered sound versus what we'll see a bit later on. Um, we also see that the, the small skips in the bass clarinet part and the kind of jumping effect like we see in measure five kind of resembles a squirrel running around on the, the forest floor. Um, it's kind of a nice thought but I think it's a really good um, uh, representation in the music. So we'll listen to this audio snippet one more time. And uh, I, I hope that this analysis provided some, um, you know, shine some light on these characteristics and uh, hopefully we can hear some more. <laughs> Moving forwards now, um, oh, wanted to play again to what I regard as really the most interesting part and most most captivating aspect of this entire piece is the tempo primo theme I am calling it. Um, so just before we begin to really dive deep into this, the tempo primo theme is uh, the term I refer it as the tempo primo theme is referring to this passage right here as included in this figure. 
Um, it doesn't always begin where we have the temporal primo marking, like we see in the second measure. Um, sometimes it does, but it, it's not always. Um, so the theme refers to the entire passage in both the bass clarinet and piano. So most marked and most striking about this passage and this theme is how symmetrical the melody is. Um, we see it's flanked by both long notes, both half notes on either side. And we see a relatively, the first half of that measure is higher and the second half is lower in the inverse upon each other. Um, so it kind of adds some distinction to that, uh, that uh, mirror image almost. Um, Eishen chooses to include an augmented fourth chord rather an augmented fourth scale degree, I'm sorry, um, at the marked C over F chord to try to give it some kind of a, a center or a pivot point or an anchor point. Um, and we also see this effect on the low G marked tenuto. Um, so harmonically, it's pretty interesting. We have a B flat chord starting, this is in concert pitch, um, a B flat to C over F with that augmented fourth in the key of B flat, but um, the, the, the quarter third in C over F. Um, and now we have my favorite chord, which I so eloquently named the E flat F G A passing chord, um, which is a, a five nine chord, which doesn't serve too much of a functional purpose and a D minor over F chord, and then a return to B flat. So we'll listen to this just quickly. really a pretty melody. Um, here we go. So I don't know why there was that effect there. Um, so this melody is really brought Two minutes, back throughout, Thank you. This melody is brought back throughout the entire piece really frequently. Um, and it's kind of coded in there. So this is the first movement. Um, we see that the resemblance to the original Tempo to Primo theme in its exposition is really quite striking. Uh, harmonically, it's almost exact, except for the uh, so lovingly named E flat F G A passing chord is substituted with the B flat seven uh, six chord, um, which does in this um, in this regard serves a more functional purpose, going to the G minor nine chord. Um, but it's also interesting, and it points to the fact that an analysis could help point these out. Um, and melodically, it's a direct quotation from the original exposition. So let's listen to this. Moving into movement two, um, the most striking and interesting uh, anecdote or example in this movement is in the coda, which I alluded to earlier. Um, so it is melodic. It's slightly, there's some slight harmonic um, semblance, but it's not as strong as harmonic where we see in the bass clarinet, uh, a direct quotation, although rather um, rhythmically uh, demuted um, to some degree, but the scale degrees line up. Um, and interestingly, in this excerpt, we see that the piano part plays the theme from the B section of movement two. So we kind of see this blending of themes from in the same movement, but also one of those themes is borrowed from the first movement. So let's listen to this quickly. Moving into movement three, in what I think is the, the prettiest excerpt of this presentation, um, we see a strong, um, melodic semblance to the Tempo Primo theme as the scale degrees are borrowed, um, although it is quite rhythmically augmented. And then, oh, I'm starting again. And then right here, we see a repetition of the first theme, um, uh, a snippet of the first theme. And finally, in the fourth movement, and this brings me to my concluding thoughts, we see that the rhythm is changed, but the scale degrees are the same. Mm -hmm. 
So what significance does this hold? Um, it proves that the Tempo Primo's theme's purpose is to create continuity between the entire work on a micro level, mark the conclusion of a individual movement, and on a macro level, serve as a, um, in the fourth movement, serve as a conclusion for the entire work. Um, so very quickly, and this will lead into any questions, an analysis being delivered prior to a performance could give a listener um, knowledge on what themes to expect, smaller details like the substitution of the 5-9 passing chord, um, and it offers the music theorist or the composer or the um, performer to really shape a listener's experience and ultimately that music exists in a liminal space, change the music itself. Um, so that's all I have on my slides. Here's my little bibliography. So I'm going to stop sharing and if anybody has any questions, please do ask. Outstanding, Marco. Thank you. This is a wonderful piece. And I, I believe I also heard Asian's B flat clarinet work at ICA a few summers ago. Maybe Julia, did you play those? I think that was you, maybe. You played all those. Yeah, wonderful I did. I, pl I actually played the other sonata from Marky e. Shin, and he gave me a copy of his unpublished B flat Ooh. sonata. You might, Marco, you might want to send an email to get your hands on that more analysis work. <laughs> Marco, this was fantastic. Who has questions for Marco? We have about two minutes for questions. So if anybody has one, you can throw it in the chat or raise your hand. Anybody have questions? I want to know if you're going to trademark the E, F, G, A flat stacked uh, chord terminology. I think that's uh, the future of musical nomenclature, and I love it. It really flows off the tongue. It's very it memorable. Really does. Well, yeah, Mark, Marco, I'm sure you can reach him um, via via email or um, via social media if you have more questions. It was really an incredible presentation, and it just makes me want to go play this wonderful piece. So congratulations, Marco. Thank you for your great work on this. Bravo. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Uh, finishing out our three student winners uh, presentations, um, we have Hannah Faircloth. Hannah is a master's student at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. And uh, she has a very exciting presentation for us um, about the intersection of music and visual art. So we will turn the floor over to Hannah. Welcome, Hannah, please. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here. Um, let me make sure I share my sound. And let's see, is that visible to all? It should be. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be discussing my findings from my independent study project I did last year. Um, basically, I painted six paintings alongside learning Eric Mandat's The Moon in My Window. Um, and during this process, I wanted to compare my artistic process and my musical process. Um, and it was a really eye-opening experience, and I'm very excited to share. Before I begin, I would like to um, go into uh, a little bit of each movement alongside the painting I did for it. Um, and so I have a little excerpts for each. I'd suggest if you have headphones to turn the volume down a little bit. So the first movement is called Butterfly Morning, and here's a snippet. The second movement. Oh. Okay. The second movement is called You're It. Um, and here's the snippet and painting. The third movement is called Peanut Butter.
Jeez. All right, here's the fourth movement music box. The fifth movement is all aboard. Um, and the final movement is called The Moon in My Window. So that's the project in its entirety, um, but how did I get there? So just like music, my artistic vision was inspired by the composer's idea of the work, as well as my own experiences. Um, the Moon in My Window was written with childhood memories in mind. Um, and so I brought my own memories to help decide my subject matter, um, medium, and matting. Um, and so, I wanted to make an intimate but almost tangible presentation of childhood from the lens of adulthood. So more of like a dreamy reflection of what happened, um, not necessarily a an exact representation. Um, and I think that fits really well with um, the background I used. It is recycled um, paper. Um, it sort of like this construction paper feel kind of takes us back to when we were children, um, you know, doing crafts and things and exploring and just having fun. And so on the flip side, also representing the reconstruction of memories um, and how memories are not always an exact representation of what happened, but more of like piecing things together. Um, the paint I used is gouache, acrylic gouache. Um, it's sort of a mix between acrylic and watercolor. That's the short of it. Um, this provides a visual connection, again, to crafts. Um, and the subject of each is influenced heavily by the movement titles, as you could tell, um, as well as my own memories. Um, for instance, you're it. The tennis shoes are girly tennis shoes <laughs> um, with some of my favorite colors. So um, the style, yeah, I would describe as flat with layered shapes. Um, I wanted simple, clean lines, again, sort of like piecing parts together. Um, and again, putting together this idea of memory. So to begin my artistic process, I sketch out um, initial ideas and let things ruminate. Um, often I'll be cooking or taking a shower and something new will pop up and I'm like, oh, I gotta go draw that. Um, and these moments will solidify choices that I'd previously decided on or sometimes take elements in new directions. Um, I remember I had the hardest time with the 
second painting, You're It. I wasn't sure what I was going to do for a very long time. Um, and so I would just leave it, come back, leave it, come back. And eventually I, I reached a point where I was, I was happy with it. So I found that I needed to spend time with these works as well as time away. Um, the push to the final product is like a snowball effect um, with the beginning being slow and gradual. So building these pieces until this push to the end, very similar to learning a piece of music. Um, when thinking about elements I might use or sketching out little ideas here and there, I would consider that, in my experience, closer to improvisational playing. Um, and I'm a part of the improv group here at SIU, and that experience of trying anything um, and exploring and discovering new sounds and ways of playing something, flipping it on its head, doing the opposite. That has really influenced my art in a wonderful way. And I think mixing all of that together has been really helpful for me. Um, in the musical process, we're all very familiar with this, um, you know, researching our composition. Um, luckily, I'm able to pick my brain of pick the brain of my professor uh, about this piece. We sat down and discussed like his inspirations and memories, uh, which was really, really helpful. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, and so as we work on a piece of music, we're learning and refining fundamental aspects, and in this case, extended techniques, um, as well as beginning to form this picture as a whole. Um, and so I wanted to, again, make sure that I was thinking about this idea of bringing back memory. And so I decided to make sure my page turns were incredibly soft, my phrasing was in the style of whichever movement, of course. Um, and yeah, um, I often make personal connections to strengthen my ideas. Um, I'm a very emotional person, and so I tend to resonate more with feelings. Um, and this piece, of, for me, was really easy to connect to. Um, as I have a lot of wonderful memories as a kid. More specifically, as an example, I remember going to the Jacksonville Zoo um, and going into the butterfly exhibit and just being fascinated by how delicate and swift these little creatures were. And so I thought about those moments and others in my life, and that really helped make my musical decisions. So I think all together, of course, when um, successful, our performances of pieces are heightened by these careful decisions. Um, and in my experience, performing this um, at the Outside the Box Festival last year, um, it was really uh, incredible to just send all of that out into the audience and have that being returned, um, affecting the overall performance quite positively. So. When we look at both processes together, um, it's there are some things that stick out that are very similar. Um, for instance, we start with the fundamentals, the building blocks, the sketch, the bare bones structure, and then we add in more and more as we're thinking about the full picture in the end. Um, and the interesting part is when we divert from that or explore along the way. Um, and I found that both affect each other, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but the difference, um, I think, is the presentation in the end. Um, performances, of course, are live and uncertain, um, whereas a presentation of a finished artwork um, can be cultivated to perfection with certainty to a point. Um, and I think this alone changes the final stage of the artistic process as compared to the musical. Um, but other than that, it's very similar. Um, and so I think with music, we have the ability to, yes, leave it out on the stage, but we have the chance to revisit it um, and bring it back as much as we would like to throughout our lives. And so we can bring new ideas to it um, as we change as people and bring something new to the work. Artwork is not typically revisited with, I'm not going to work on these specific paintings again, but I might 
rework the ideas in the future. Um, who knows? But I think that's really special because they hold a picture of ourselves in that moment in time where we were as an artist in person. And I think the same thing as live performances. And so it's wonderful now in this day and age, we have recordings and everything to be able to capture those moments. So I think um, this project uh, in general was very eye-opening. Um, and I found that working on both simultaneously was insightful to how I create. Um, and it provided a stream of inspiration from one art form to the other. Um, for instance, like I said, um, with Butterfly Morning, thinking about how I'm going to play those opening phrases very fluttery. Well, I also wanted to include a whimsical butterfly. So I always think about the blue Morpho, which as a kid I was obsessed with. <laughs> um, and so, again, these ideas just bouncing off one another. And I think um, the paintings reveal my musical process. I see that anyway. Um, and. I think they provide a wonderful guide to the performance. So I think, you know, anytime we work in multiple domains, um, we can become more effective artists. Um, I would love to do this again um, or push it further into something new. This is a relatively new um, study for me, um, looking at the intersection of art and music. I began a project my senior year in undergrad that I wasn't able to complete, and so I'm really fortunate to have been able to spend time on something like this um, because I find it incredibly exciting. So if there are any questions about anything at all, um, you can reach me at my contact info um, or follow me on Instagram or YouTube. Um, and so if you have any questions about anything, um, I think, I think that'll be it. <clears throat> Outstanding, Hannah. Thank you so much. Are there questions for Hannah? You can drop them in the chat or you can raise your hand, either one. We've got a question, Hannah. What was your favorite movement and maybe why? Definitely the moon in my window, the last movement. I'll go back to it. Um, it's, it reminds me of those moments when you're lying in bed, falling asleep, drifting away, um, just letting everything go for the day. And playing it is really meditative. And I just loved the imagery um, that I was able to come up with. Um, it's just really beautiful. Um, that's a good question, thank you. There's another question in the chat. Um, will you continue to explore this intersection as you prepare future works? This comes from Robert Moody. Hi, thank you, Robert. Yes, I fully intend to do so. This is my area that I wanna dive into um, throughout my career. Um, for instance, I like the project I mentioned before, I was going to play in front of giant paintings um, based off of movements of a work I prepared for my senior recital. Um, and I would love to do that again. I would also love to develop ways to do projects with art and music that maybe kids could use in the classroom or even ways of studying pieces with art techniques. I don't know, I'm throwing ideas out there. Um, I would love to work on in this area for sure. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, I'm not a visual artist at all, but how could I maybe be engage visual art as I prepare a piece of music? What could I try? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Well, if you have a pencil and paper, you can do whatever you'd like. And my favorite thing is when people are like, oh, I wish I could draw. And I know we experience this a lot as musicians. We hear, oh, I wish I could play an instrument. It just takes practice. And so I would say, first of all, get rid of any pre, um, any ideas of expectations you may have about art. Um, just put the pencil or colored pencil or marker on the page, turn on some music, and just let it, let it flow. See what happens. It can be anything. Um, and I do this a lot as some exercises. I'll turn on music and paint to it. Um, or a piece I'm working on, I might draw something or paint something that 
reminds me of the piece. And so I know we use the idea of color a lot when learning a piece of music, like, oh, this movement sounds red or yellow. Why not use those colors in a piece of art? Um, even cutting up paper and gluing it together. There's endless, endless things you could do. Um, and that might help you, you know, if you wanted to, here's an idea, cut up different pieces of paper that are different colors, maybe gradients of oranges and red, to show the intensity of a phrase, sort of mapping out the phrase in an analysis or something. That would be interesting. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I Andy, love that. Thank you, that's a Andy, great answer. Andy, this is Bob Spring. May I ask one quick question? Yeah, please, jump in, Bob. Hannah, did you get a chance to talk to Kelly Johnson at all about the piece? I did not, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the future you can connect with her and see what you think. Yes, I would love to do that. Um, last question. What do you envision the future of this medium looking like in a performance? So maybe how do you see these things defining your performance moving forward, intersecting these identities? Well, um, if I were doing this in concert with these paintings, I would probably project them. Um, I've also had this idea of doing a gallery um, set up where the paintings are hung normally as they would in a gallery, but having um, headphones by each painting. So anyone who is perusing the art could pick it up and listen to the painting come to life in music. Um, other ideas, again, projecting or even live painting to music. Uh, another idea was to, again, stand in front of music or paintings or maybe even um, I don't know, getting other people involved would be interesting. Um, I'm open to lots of ideas and directions this could go. I think there's no wrong way of doing it. I love that. It's a great place for us to leave it. Thank you, Hannah. It was wonderful. Thank you for the presentation. Um, huge gratitude and congrats to all of our winning student presenters, to Megan and Marco and Hannah. This was such an incredible afternoon of information, uh, clearly the future of our Industry is bright. Many thanks to all the people who took time to adjudicate those submissions and congrats to our students. Uh, we'll see you soon at the closing session. I think that link will be dropped in the chat soon. Thank you, everyone.